παιδιά Ιέσου. Με τη λέγη να τον δει του Μπογέ. Θα πάω πιο καρύμι. Αλλιάζα κούγια θα πάω πιο καρύμι. Θα πάει 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 πιο καρύμι. Θα And so when you have that uh, attitude in your mind that you are not going to lose patience, that he has not yet come. And that's so we are happy that he's coming. And one of these days he's going to carry us in his chariot. And there we shall be. And we shall be happy forever and ever. Amen. My name, uh, well, do I have to repeat that now? Now that uh, my brother has just me, and all of you most probably know me, George Mwani, and I'm happy to be here, I'm always happy to be at this university as we continue. And I was just telling him, a man when we were sitting here after they have acted, and I said we just need to say grace and go, because they have uh, preached by someone. This brother in a red jacket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? That was very nice. I uh, enjoyed it, it completely. And so we will try to summarize or elaborate on what they have done, shaped by the scriptures. Shaped by the scriptures is our topic. We are going to read a few verses of scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 9, and then I jump to 20. These are the words of Moses, or the words of God through Moses, to the children of Israel, when Moses was preparing to leave. And so before he left, he left a will, which is recorded for us even today. And it is written from number one verse, that these are the commands, decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go. I pray, our Father, that as we contemplate upon your earth this morning, that you will be pleased to open our eyes that we may see wonderful things from your Lord. I pray that you will teach it to all of us individually, so that even as we live here, we will go knowing that the Lord has instructed us. And so we pray that the blessed teacher, even the Spirit of God, will teach us even his word this morning. Because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Very good. Let me start by saying that the scriptures were written by God. So that when we are thinking about these scriptures, we are talking about God himself taking a pen and writing them down so that he will be able to give them to his people. The Bible tells us that from very early when God summoned Moses on the mountain, that is on the Mount of Sinai, that God gave him what is called the Ten Commandments. And the Bible tells us that these Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God, that it is God himself who wrote these words. And he did not write it once, but he wrote it twice, as you read in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 9 and chapter 10. Because the first time Moses broke them, when he came down from the mountain, and they found that the children of Israel had been uh, for a second God, he was so annoyed, but God summoned him, summoned him again. And then he told him, I want two more tablets of the same kind, and I want to rewrite what you crushed. I keep saying that it shows how important the written word, the Ten Commandments were to God, because God did not ask Moses to rewrite what they had written, but God himself repeated the process. Then number two, it is God himself who appointed all the men. In fact, I say that he had picked them. 
who wrote the rest of the scriptures, right from Moses, whom we know that God raised him in the household of Pharaoh, at a place when he was supposed to die, at a time when he was supposed to be killed by Pharaoh himself, Pharaoh gave him life. But it is God who was in charge of the life of Moses. And it is this Moses who, after he received the Ten Commandments, received another set of laws, over 600 of them, and then God commanded him to write them. And I keep saying that it was not the idea of Moses to write the rest of the law, but it is God who commanded him. You can read that in Exodus 34 and verse 27. That it is God who commanded Moses. And then when you follow the rest of scripture, the word scripture simply means what is written, sacred writings, you will find that for every book that was written, God himself picked the man, whether he was a prophet, whether he was a shepherd, and it is him who trained the man, equipped the man, gave the man the words, and later on commanded the man to write their scriptures. And there are many illustrations we can give this morning to be able to show that that is true. I think the one that I love most uh, going through the Old Testament is Jeremiah, whom the Bible tells us when he complained about his calling, God told him that, you Jeremiah, before even you were formed in your mother's womb, what happened? I knew you, isn't it? And I appointed you to be a prophet for the nations, to plant and to uproot. And towards the end of his ministry, God had spoken many things through Jeremiah. And it was likely that the people were not taking them seriously. And therefore God commanded Jeremiah to take a scroll. Jeremiah chapter 36. The whole of that chapter is very interesting. Take a scroll and write every prophet that I have spoken to you from the moment when I started speaking to you. From the first prophecy. And Jeremiah took the scroll, gave it to Baruch, and Baruch himself scraped or wrote those down as Jeremiah was dictating to them. And he finished, wrote everything, and then the scroll found its way into the household of the king. King Jehoiakim was the king then. And every time the king read through the scriptures that were written by Jeremiah, he would tear them and burn them in the fire. And therefore he thought that he had destroyed the word of God. But who is God? You know? And so God told Jeremiah, don't worry. We are the ones who wrote. So take another scroll, dictate the same things, and rewrite the same things that we wrote from the beginning. But what is more, Jeremiah, he told, God told Jeremiah, we are going to include much more. After which God gave Jeremiah the formula for preserving the scroll that he had written. Tie them with a piece of string, throw them into the sea, and there they were. And that's what we need today as the scriptures of Jeremiah. Paul himself, after he has written the word of God, says that he was appointed by God to be a prophet, to be an apostle, even before he was born. In fact, he says that while he was in his father's womb, God called him. I always find it difficult to accept that, but that is the word of God. Because you know, Paul was the persecutor of the church, isn't it? So that Paul is claiming that even while I was persecuting the church of Christ, God knew me. Are you following? Yes. And therefore, he saw me, even when Stephen was being killed, even God was there. <laughs> we were with him. And God saw that I was killing Stephen. And yet, it is the same God who saved me, and then he called me, and then Paul says that on, not only did he call me, but he appointed me to be three things. A herald, an apostle, and a teacher to the Gentiles. And therefore, he defends what he wrote. And that is why, therefore, we have read 2 Timothy chapter 3, where he says, All scripture is God read, isn't it? This is the Paul who wrote that. And you can be able to believe, therefore, that the words that Paul is writing were not his words. Because Paul was a murderer when he was born. <laughs> but in the course of his life, God redeemed him and gave him a different purpose. And he told him, I want you to write the letters and the words of scripture to the Gentiles. And that is why we say that today you cannot know faith if you are a Gentile without the Paul. Paul is the one who defines us. He's the one who teaches us. He's the one who shows us what God wants for us. And therefore he says that when you read this scripture that I have written, God is going to instruct you. 
For he says that it uses for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, the scriptures summarize the mind of God on what he expects his relationship with man to be. In the scriptures, God summarizes his mind because the mind of God is so broad. The scriptures cannot contain the mind of God. But yet what God expects man to know on how he should be able to relate with him and how man should be able to behave while he is here on earth, God has summarized that in the scriptures. So that if any man wants to find the mind of God, to know how God thinks, to know how God, what God expects, then he must find himself again in the scriptures. And after God has written those scriptures we have seen, with the intention of summarizing his mind in the scriptures, notice, he gave the responsibility to know the scriptures to the man himself. So that the man who is ignorant of the scriptures cannot blame God. He can only blame himself. Because God has given it, and then he has instructed that the scriptures be read. So that the man who does not read and is ignorant of God cannot blame God for his ignorance. And so when you're talking about being shaped in the, in the scriptures, we are simply saying that it is your choice to determine to what extent you are going to allow the scriptures to do what? To shape you, to mold you, to train you, to teach you, because it is your responsibility. What do we mean? The scripture we have read in the book of Deuteronomy says a number of things concerned with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. Just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home, and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. We go to verse 20. In the future, when your son asks you what is the meaning of the stipulations, the decrees, and the laws the Lord our God has commanded you, tell him, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt. A mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible, upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land that he promised on oath to our forefathers. The Lord commanded us to obey all his decrees and to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as in the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as He commanded us, then that will be our righteousness. And then I will go to 2 Timothy, chapter 3, and read you what they excited from verse 14. Paul writes to his son Timothy, again it is a form of a will that he is requesting his son Timothy as he lives. And he tells him from verse 14, But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God, and is useful to teach us what is true, and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Our Heavenly Father, may the meditation of my heart and the word is right. And the first thing that you notice is that God commanded all the fathers of Israel to have the word of God 
fully stored in their hearts. Therefore, he says that these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. That is the first instruction. So that before they think of anybody else, he was speaking to them. The commandments are to be upon your heart. And so it was the responsibility of the fathers of Israel. Because basically the community of the Israelites is a patriarchal. I mean, it is centered on the man. And therefore God says, you men, these commandments that I've given you today are to be upon your heart. So they had to work very hard in order to have the word of God stored in their hearts. So that the man of Israel, who was devoid of scripture, could not blame Moses. Because Moses had received the word, given it to the men, and therefore they were responsible for what they knew. Number two, having stored them in their hearts, God directed and commanded the parents to pass on these commandments to their children. And then it is like God is removing the responsibility slowly by slowly from himself. God helped them, gave Moses through writing the Ten Commandments himself, then he commands Moses to write. Now Moses has written and he's passing on to the generations that are coming up. He visited. So from the fathers he says, you fathers, hide them in your hearts. But beyond there, I want you to teach them to your children. And I would like you to use that word that is used there. Impress them. Impress these scriptures on your children. You see, the word impress is very interesting in the way it is sometimes translated. But it basically means to put a permanent mark in the heart. It is to engrave. It is to put as a seal. You know the way you would want to say, this belongs to George Wangi. And so George Wangi makes a seal. And then every paper that I press has the name of George Wangi. You see? So that every person who sees that thing from them henceforth, he doesn't want to, he doesn't need to inquire. He simply looks at it and ah, this belongs to who? To George Wangi. It bears my mark. In other words, what God wants is that the children should bear the mark of God. And the mark of God was the commandments of God. So that from the time when they are born, I want you to impress these commandments in their hearts. So that as they grow, they know nothing else except what God wants of them. Are we together? So that the child who becomes ignorant of the commandments of God in the community of Israel, the father has to blame. Are we together? That is when they are young. And that is why from the age when they were born to the age of about 12, every Israelite child, and especially the sons, were taken to the teaching centers. Later on, they became known as synagogues. And there they were instructed on how to memorize the word of God. So that that word itself carries that idea that they have to have the word of God in their heart as a store. So that wherever the child goes, out of the store of his heart, he brings out the word. And that's why you will meet with Jesus and the devil. And Jesus does not ask to bring the Bible. He says it is written. Why did Jesus run, learn when it is written? Where it is written? By reading the scroll himself. And Jesus was a very good Bible reader, by the way. He interacted with the scroll. So that by the time he reached the age of being taken out of the house, which was at the age of 12, you started becoming responsible as a son. Then from there he can go there and argue and debate with the elders. And that's why when he, at that age he was left at the temple by the man. You remember when he was lost in the temple? He was found there discussing things in the kingdom with the elders. And then he told the mother, I am supposed to be in my mother's house. So that that was the responsibility of the parents to make sure that the children know the word of God. Therefore, God expected his commandments to shape, to model the children as they grew up so that none of them would be ignorant of the scriptures. And I want you to see that God even defines the manner in which this was to be done. And so he says, number one, talk about them, isn't it? Talk about them when? When you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. I want you to imagine those four situations. They define a lifestyle, isn't it? 
commandments of the Lord. So that they were supposed to be totally saturated. That's the word. Totally saturated. So that whether they turn to the east or to the west, whether they go in front or come backwards, they will be oozing, if you like. They will be boiling, if you like, the word of God from their hearts. That's what they were supposed to do. Not only that, that they were supposed to talk about it all the time, so that it was a way of life, but number two, they were supposed to make the scriptures visible. So that they were not just using the ear gate to communicate the scriptures, but they were also using the, the eye gate. Therefore, he says, tie them as symbols on your hands. So you can imagine a father in Israel, which the Pharisees later on took and decided that they were very religious. So they would imprint the scriptures everywhere. On the forehead, you see? Bind them on your foreheads. So you can imagine writing a scripture here. <laughs> and so wherever you go, everybody can read that one that you've written there. So eventually they ended up making clothes that they had excessive material. <laughs> so that on these materials they would be printing the word of God. So wherever he turns, love the Lord your God with all your heart. When he turns like this, for this, you know, all those kinds of words. So that wherever you go, whether you are in the market, if you are not hearing, you are seeing the word of God. And therefore he says, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And that is where you have gotten the concept of what you have done here. You see? This one has been then visible to you. It has been written uh, at the door frames. So that whenever you come into this room, I don't know whether you move them after today, everybody who comes, the first thing they see, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And when you read that, then you are so, what does that mean? So the idea was to make sure that the children, that the minds of the children, or the people of Israel, their thinking system, was controlled by the word of God. So that God was interested in what they were thinking. For it is himself who said, as a man thinker, and that is in heart. And it doesn't mean that, by the way, that does not mean that if I start thinking that I'm water now, I'm going to become water. <laughs> that is not what it means. It means that you have to Train yourself in values of a long period of time. It is what you deposit of a period of time. So that they start defining your values. So that what we see in your future is determined by what was laid down in your past. Are we together? So that then when we say, somebody speaks and says that it is a slip of the tongue, there is nothing like a slip of the tongue. It is out of your heart, the mouth speaks. So that if I were with this brother, and perhaps we go on and we become on the opposite sides, like the way they are doing now. And you reach a place and you hide a, a politician, say, a kibin. And then he says, ah, I see for a dark side. You no, 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 that is what you have been thinking about me <laughs> all this time. It is only that the opportunity to say that has not availed itself. But now, at the heat of the moment, what you say at the heat of the moment, that is what your heart is telling you. And so, well, for example, we are like if you happy, as, as whatever in the heart, the mouth speaks, isn't it? And so the mouth speaks, defines you. So God expected that the values of these children, the community of Israel, are decided from the heart. So that the word of God now is the one that determines how they think, how they value, how they speak, so that eventually they can be able to say that. So may the word visible, so that you impress. So on themselves, but how much the children knew depended on their parents while the children were in their mother's house. Sunday school is good, but Sunday school is just a small portion of what is expected. If the children do not learn the Bible in your house, they will never learn. So that the first teacher, as far as the instruction of the word of God is concerned, is the mother and the father. The father gives the, is the maintainer of this plea. When the children are there with the mother, the only thing that they need to hear is God, isn't it? Talk about them. Unfortunately, because us ourselves in our modern generation are so 
dry with the word of God, we have looked for things in our homes where that we make them visible. And one of the things that has happened to us in modern generation, there are so many things that steal our eyes, you know, so that you do not have time to engage your eyes with the word of God. I don't know what is it that you do with your eyes when you are on your phone, when you are watching TV, and when you are... What, what is it that you allow your eyes to get into your heart? And what is it that you allow your ears to gather? Whatever enters through the ears, whatever goes through the eyes, eventually determines how your heart is going to respond then from there. So that when they talk about the loss of morality, in those words that you were saying here, it is not that it cannot be controlled, it is not that it cannot be redefined, but it simply depends on what has been going into our hearts. So that our influence is coming from things that are ungodly. Because, truth be told, the media has no time with God. And so whatever you see, those dramas that you see, those laughters that are made to make us laugh, at the end of the story they even repeat you, God. And therefore they inform, so eventually they determine how our lives are going to be turned. And so it is our responsibility. We have to be diligent so that we are able to do that. Now, the question would be, why is God quote unquote mad in this way? Why would God demand that the words, the commandments that he's giving, the scriptures that he's giving, be made to have room in the hearts of the people of Israel, the children of Israel? Why is it that God would want these scriptures to shape the way the children of Israel think and so on and so forth? Now, there are three main values that God wanted to be taught through the scriptures. I call them the three pillars. And if you have got three, these, three, uh, these pillars in your heart, then you are on your way to loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, according to what he expects. The first pillar, or the first value, is the fear of God. And the book of Deuteronomy has told us very clearly. In fact, the whole book of Deuteronomy basically addresses the fear of God. God was so interested that the children of Israel know how to fear him. Then the second value is, or pillar is the knowledge of God. The fear of God, number one, the knowledge of God, number two, and number three, the wisdom of God. And all these three are directly acquired through the word of God. You cannot have the fear of God you cannot have the knowledge of God and you cannot have the wisdom of God unless you are interacting with the word of God. So that God has given us the scriptures to learn the fear of God. To learn the fear of God. See, already we have read that portion, Deuteronomy chapter 6. The reason why they are interacting with the stipulations, the decrees, the precepts, is so that they may do what? Learn to fear the Lord their God. So that the objective therefore of reading or having those scriptures in their hearts is so that they may learn how to fear God. It is the objective that God wants to be achieved. And it is very interesting because you see that to fear God does not come as a talent. To fear God does not come as a gift. To fear God does not come as an anointing. So that, for example, you would come here and I pray for you to have the anointing that causes you to fear God. You will not have it. <laughs> and the fear of God is supposed to be the same. So that you cannot say that Judge Monty fears God, that my brother here who fears God. Because God has given my brother one talent of fearing God, and he has given Judge Monty five talents of fearing God. So that when you, you see Judge Monty fearing God more than my brother, my brother can go to God and say, you give Judge Monty five talents you have given one only. But I have decided not to fear you, so I have decided to bury it under the sun. <laughs> then the Lord will say what? <laughs> you lazy and wicked servant. You refused. God does not give us his fear like that. And so we say from the scriptures as we are reading that the fear of God is land. You train yourself in the fear of God. One of the best illustrations on an individual basis is found in Deuteronomy chapter 17 which we call the conditions for kingship 
And God had anticipated that in the course of time, the children of Israel were going to desire to have a king over their lives. And so in chapter 17, he gave them conditions. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't marry many wives. Don't acquire silver and gold, and so on and so forth. Then from verse 18, he gives the condition to do with the word of God. And all he says, that when the king sits on his throne, let him go into the temple where the Levites sat, and then let him let him make let himself let let him make a copy for himself of this law that is the Levites in the temple, and then he is to bring this this copy of the law in his house, and then notice the reason why it was with him in the house, so that he may read it. All the days of his life. For what reason? That he may learn to fear the Lord his God. So that if the king read the scroll, studied the scriptures, then God assured him that that way he was going to train his heart on fearing God. I would like you to notice that the king is already anointed. Are we together? That the king is already set apart. So that this person that God is talking about is a person who is already set apart for ministry. A person already set apart to serve God. But God says, as far as you learning how to walk with me, fearing me, that is your responsibility. But I have given you the aid to do that. Get the scroll, Read it all the days of your life, and then you will learn how to fear me. Then from there you are going to know how to serve me, and from there I am going to multiply your service to me. I am even going to bless your children, and the land is going to prosper because of doing that. And every king, if you read the rest of the history of the children of Israel and their kings, every king who discovered the scroll, read it as a way of life, feared God. Not only did he fear God, but he also taught the rest of the children of Israel how to walk in the fear of God. Because they were able to train their hearts to fear God is simply to know what God wants and then to do it. It is not magical. It is something that you simply say, God wants me not to commit sexual immorality. That is what he wants. So I am not going to commit sexual immorality. God says I should not steal. I mean, you don't even have need to have a a circle of friends to ask you what do you think God is saying here when he says you don't steal. <laughs> it is clear. He says don't steal. Therefore I am not going to steal. God says do not marry an unbeliever. So you don't sit around and say she is beautiful. She also comes to church. You know she, she is always quiet. When I get her I am going to convert her. Then she's going to become safe in my house. <laughs> you don't fear God when you go in that direction. The one who fears God says, God says, I shall not be unequally yoked with one who does not know Christ. Because knowing Christ is not beauty, is not handsomeness, is not quietness. It is righteousness in the heart. If there is no righteousness in the heart, I am not going to get an equally your end of story. Go with your beauty to those who love beauty. I love righteousness. Iyo manano kikamaliza. Sasa uwe kika hapa nyuma ukiwambia uge uulize maswali ni kutuwa. Shabele mare ya kaa who is not safe. Or there is this boy, you know, he then comes to church. So what? They doesn't mean anything to come to church. This is a building with people who are meeting. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Whether all of them love the Lord. Whether all of them love the Lord is a different story. <laughs> Do you see what it means to fear God? Does God say it? I believe it, therefore I do it. That man fears God. That man fears God. And when you fear God and walk in the fear of God, God blesses you. God will establish you. 
Because the path that you are going to walk in are going to be determined by God. That's what God is saying. That is what God is saying. So when King Josiah, for example, discovered the word of God, he brought a revival into the community. You can read the story in 2 Kings chapter 22. The word had been lost in the temple. People are not reading the word of God. But then it was rediscovered. It was read by the elders. They brought it to the king. The king read it. He received the word. And then he brought the community. They read the word of God. And the word of God revived the whole community. And then they went serving God. But before that time, the word of God had been lost there. And therefore, King Manasseh never read the word of God. His grandfather never read the word of God. And therefore, what Manasseh did is was he turned the kingdom of Judah into an idolatrous kingdom to the point where he was erecting idols in the temple. The word of God, once it produces the fear of God in you, you simply walk in that. And you can say of many others, but I think that is enough. The fear of God. The reason why, for example, the kingdom of the north, you know there were two kingdoms that separated. The kingdom of Judah in the south, the kingdom of Israel in the north. The reason why none of the kings ever feared God, because none of them feared God, and therefore they led the children of Israel into idolatry, is because King Jeroboam, who was the first one to form that kingdom, went and erected his own altar away from Jerusalem. And then he created the two gods, two idol gods, and placed them in that altar. And then he told all the Israelites that these are your gods who brought you out of the, 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 the land of Israel. Worship them. And therefore he went ahead and created his own priests. Anybody who wanted to be a priest would come to the Israel and say, I am volunteering for the priesthood. And then he would anoint that priest. And then they would serve God. Because they were serving God without the mind of God. They had left the mind of God in Jerusalem. Therefore, they became apostate. And each of them without exception. And that's why the kingdom of the north was taken into exile before the kingdom of the south. Because their time of judgment arrived earlier. <laughs> the land of, of Judah. Because from time to time, the Judah, the, the, the one of the south will sanctify themselves. God restores them and says, I've increased your years. But these ones never. The fear of? So when you read the scriptures, they shape your heart to fear God. And when your heart is shaped and modeled to fear God, then you walk in that fear. There is a way in which the fear of God puts you in a straight kind of road that is very narrow. You almost look like you are stupid. You see? You keep walking. You never look to the right or to the left. You always walk on that narrow path because that is where the word of God is leading you. Then the second value is to get the knowledge of God. To get the knowledge of God. The Bible tells us in that well scripture, scripture that you know in Hosea chapter 4 that my people perish for lack of knowledge. But I would like you to read slightly below because that's where most of us reach. When you read there then you will discover how comes they had perished. How comes they were not having the knowledge of God. And then you will discover it is because they had rejected the law of God. And that word rejection can also be translated ignore. They had ignored it. They had rejected it. And for that reason, both priests and the prophets and the people of Israel did not know God. In other words, they did not know the requirements of God. And therefore, God ignored them himself. And that's why he says there below that because they ignored the law of God, God also ignored their priests. And then he gave their children over. And that is the reason why they, all of them were expelled from. So that you see what we say in Deuteronomy. When the priests have lost the law, it means that the fathers will not have access to the law. It means that the fathers will not instruct their children. So when God rejects the priesthood, he will reject the men of the land. Then he will reject the children of the men of the land. And all of them without exception will be destroyed. And that is why when God comes to destroy a land, like he used to come to destroy the land of Israel, he did not even spare the children. They were not considered innocent. Even pregnant women, children not yet born. And, and you, you wonder how God, how, will God be doing that with his 
eyes open. You see? This is a woman, pregnant, eight months about to give birth. But God still sends an army with a sharpened sword and they pierce the woman, cut the, the womb and the child comes out. And God continues as if nothing happened. Whenever God ignores a people, the people are going to perish. And when the people start perishing, there is no distinction between the old, the young, male or female. But when the people know God, the opposite is true. God himself comes to guard them. He takes care of them. He shields them because they have come to know him. Therefore, God has preserved the knowledge of himself in the scriptures. Only the man who digs the scriptures would find the knowledge of God. It is the reason why Jesus said that if you continue in my word, you shall know. You shall know. That word is very important. You shall have knowledge. You shall know the truth and then the truth shall set you free. Therefore, if you ignore the scriptures, you do not know the knowledge of God. And therefore, if you do not know the knowledge of God, you stay in your slavery. You cannot be delivered. And so our hearts, once they are shaped, they help us to know God. And then the third pillar is to gain the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. See, my time has started saying goodbye. Now, wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge to a specific situation so that you can be able to do the will of God. It is possible to have knowledge of God, but be unable to apply that knowledge in everyday living. And that depends on the way you are interacting with God. So that when you walk in the knowledge of God, God continues to train you so that you now learn to make decisions. That you know that if I wanted to build a house, I don't build it on sand, for example. It's just a general illustration. But I build it on rock. But a person who does not have the know-how, it doesn't matter where he builds the house. He only thinks, let me build that house. Therefore, he wakes up, clears the land, builds the house. Only for him to discover later that he did not do due diligence and he built his house on sand. So wisdom is the ability to know the difference, to discern. And so the children of Israel had lost that ability because they had also rejected the word of God. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 8, the Lord rebukes the children of Israel for claiming that they have got wisdom. In fact, they used to boast from time to time. And they would say, as we are fine, as we have got the wisdom. But then when God came to rebuke them through Jeremiah, he told them, you children of Israel, I have a problem with you. You are unlike the birds of the air. Because when it comes to going to Knowing seasons, he says that the swift and the rush and the thrush are very good. They know how to migrate. I'm reading from verse 6, my own reinterpreting it. So they know how to make decisions to go and lay the eggs when the time for laying eggs comes. Alright? They know how to, the turtles know how to come out the, the deep sea, come to the shallow ground in the sun, lay their eggs so that their eggs can hatch. But he told the children of Israel, but you children of Israel do not know that. And the reason you don't know that is because you are handling my word falsely. The scribes are teaching you to handle my word in a false way. For that reason, instead of believing the truth and having wisdom, you are believing a lie. And yet even that, he says, you are continuing to claim that you have got wisdom. Then he asks them a question. Seeing that you do not have the word of God, seeing that you have rejected the word of God, what kind of wisdom do you have? In other words, God was saying that the of the scriptures, they are the ones who will be able to train the children of Israel to make decisions. So that the children of Israel reached a place where they became foolish. And so unlike the turtles and the birds, they would lay their eggs wherever they please. And whenever they make their eggs, whatever they please, in other words, when they make their decisions, they did not make the distinction between what was good and what was evil. They mixed it. 
and therefore they ended up being foolish. And for that reason, they were not able to make decisions. And because they were not able to make decisions, they started worshipping false gods. They would make idols and take them to the temple. They would give their young ladies to foreign men. Their foreign men who marry their girls. They ended up having a mixture of children, which eventually made them to be taken into exile. So they were not able to be sad, um, including other small things. Therefore, we say that God has preserved his way of wisdom in the scriptures. And the man who digs the scriptures is the one who will have access to the wisdom of God. And I keep saying that God's wisdom is so different from the wisdom of the world that sometimes when you make a decision as a child of God, it seems like you're doing a foolish thing. And I've given that illustration. When you're making a decision to marry, decision to get a job, I mean, the, those decisions, in, what, in which way do you make that decision yourself when you want to please God? And so, when you... The, the Word of God is not shaping our hearts. We are not able to apply the Word of God to our particular situations. I think time does not allow. I wanted to do a practical illustration from my own life, but I think we can do that another time. But the Apostle James, let's start concluding. Says in James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it is says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at himself in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. In other words, it's not the mere reading of the word. It is not simply satisfying yourself that I have opened the Bible. But God is saying that it is possible to interact with that Bible, with that word, and yet the Bible has no effect. The scriptures have no effect on you. And so you are looking at yourself in the mirror. The mirror tells you, my dear, you have got a part of white porridge on your forehead. And then you say, ah, I am going to remove it on my way out. But because you are pressed for time, you don't have time, that's what it says. As soon as it tells you and you live where the mirror is, you forget. Then what do you do? You emerge out. What is on your forehead? A patch of white porridge. And so that people say, <laughs> and I know what you drink. You drink porridge without sugar. <laughs> it's white. <laughs> In other words, what has happened? Your nakedness has been exposed. So that although the mirror instructed you, you are so much pressed for time, you didn't have enough whatever to change yourself, then you left. And so God says, when you see that kind of man, know that the mirror is not helping him, isn't it? Although he interacted with the mirror. But there is another kind of man, verse 25. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that is freedom, continues to do this, not forgetting what he has had, but doing it, what will do? He will be blessed in what he does. Blessed in what he does. In other words, when the mirror tells this man you have got a patch of white porridge on your forehead, because he has got time, he is not pressed, he is not casual, he takes a cloth, dips in water, removes the white patch, gets oil, he is not in a hurry. He oils himself, looks at himself again, compares his image with what he can be able to see, and then he says, everybody would like what they see. <laughs> and then he is not in a hurry too. He leaves the house because he has got time, isn't it? And then when the people come out, they say, behold, the man. I may not even be handsome, but when you look at the way I have prepared myself. <laughs> know what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that it is the time that you spend in the word of God that shapes you. When you are casual about it, the word has no time for your heart. But when you are serious, your intent is focused, you are reading the word of God slowly, 
studying the word of God slowly. In fact, you go beyond studying by memorizing it. You go beyond memorizing and meditate on the word of God, which he calls looking with intensity. Then the word of God starts moving the patches of porridge in your heart. So the word of God tells you you have got a part of white porridge in your heart. So it tells you you are angry, you are bitter, you are immoral, you are a thief. You know? And then when the, heart, the word of God tells you like that, you don't tell and argue with the word. It is the one who has the decisions that you make, the actions you take, are now defined. And that is now how we say that the word of God changes you slowly by slowly. So when Paul writes to us and says that from glory to glory, by the Spirit of God who says the word of God, slowly by it, slowly. It is like the way a blacksmith takes a, a rusted metal and then he buys a sandpaper, you know, and then he says, I want to, you know the way they are making cars, isn't it? Very old red robbers or land robbers in a pair of garage it is renewed. I don't know what, I'm forgetting what that word they use. And so you take the sandpaper without hurry. And then you restore the metal to the original. When we get converted, we still have our own limitations. The heart is new, but our character is still the old character. We have had, 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 the heart is new, but we are still getting troubled with the thoughts that we had in the beginning. Your own life does not evaporate immediately. But then what happens is that because now you have a new heart, the new heart gives you the ability to enjoy God. So you, when you are here with God, now God says, uh -uh, this is what I use to model people. Take my word. Then from there you are going to know what I think, what I mean. And then slowly by slowly, we call it discipleship. Discipleship is the process of taking a rusted metal and then using a sandy paper, the word of God, to start. Are you seeing the picture? So eventually it might take long, but eventually I'll be as bright as the original. So that when you see me, there are many years of being modeled by the word of God, being shaped by the truth. That is what James is here saying. Therefore, it is only the man who does the will of God, according to James, who is blessed in whatever he does. The reason why he is blessed in whatever he does is because he has discovered the will of God, therefore he does the will of God, and therefore he is blessed in what he does. And that is very, therefore important to cultivate as an attitude, an attitude that helps you define the word of God. And so it is important that you make the decision to be the man, isn't it? Make the decision to be the man. Because it says, but then, man. Are you the man? Make that decision. When you make the decision, focus your concentration on the word of God. Because he says he looks with intensity, isn't it? Focused concentration. When you are reading the word of God, read with concentration. When you are memorizing, memorize with concentration. When you are reflecting, reflect with concentration. Do not be in a hurry. After all, one of these days you are going to die and leave everything behind, isn't it? What is it that you are going to leave behind and what are you going to carry ahead? And one of the things that I was reflecting upon this morning as I thought is that there are many type things that we engage ourselves in. We fight. Then on the day when we die, you enter heaven, you are almost like you are naked. Because you, you see, we leave everything that is behind. It is Job who said that. Naked I came. There are only three things that are going to last forever. God, yourself, your souls, and the word of God. Everything else, including uh, the, the things that you get yourselves in, are going to die. And so, let us focus with concentration because we want to change our lives for eternity. And then he says you make it a habit. You are the man, you look with concentration, but then you make it a habit. He and then when you do that, you treasure in your heart. Not forgetting what he has, had. And the only way to guard against forgetting is to memorize the word of God and write it down. Then that way the word of God is going to be written. By the word, scripture memory basically means writing the word of God in your heart. The way you write it on a piece of paper. So that continuous repetition, when you keep repeating the word of God to yourself, there is a way in which the Spirit writes those words. 
into your heart so that you're able to remember them. And then once you do that, then he says, you do what he has said you, you do. So that the doing is the outcome. And it is the one that he has expressed to us that you have been shaped by the word of God. And when we do that, then we can be able to walk in that way of God. Is that difficult to do? It is not difficult to do. We can be able to do it. The scriptures are wonderful. And our time is over. So let's, let's, therefore, as a practical point of application, although we are saying about reading the word, doing all these things, there is a word that the scriptures uses. Okay, that word is discipleship. It comes from the word learning. That unless you learn, unless you are taught, Isaiah 50 and verse 4, he wakens me morning by morning. He gives me an instructed tongue. There is that giving yourself. And I'm not saying that it is a simple part, but it's a part that you dedicate yourself in. That I'm going to train myself. I'm going to, to be a place where God instructs me. And I have discovered that whenever you give yourself for a period of time with other people, then it becomes easier for you to be able to learn. And that's why then we do what we do to help people to read the word of God. You eat. get instructed. It is not something that is going to happen overnight, but over time. In the fact, it's a lifestyle, we say, that eventually makes you what you are. But the thing is, be the man, be focused, continue, treasure it, isn't it? Then you obey, and God will help you. May the, scripture, may the scriptures <laughs> shape us, even as we continue to wait on the Lord. God bless you.